Ah, there you go. You're ready when I am now, are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, potentially, this is our last meeting of this council. So it's good to see so many here. I don't know whether Councillor Pearce is joining us via... Oh, um... I don't believe he is, Chair. OK. Um, so um, apologies, please, uh, Cathy. I have no apologies, but I believe Terry is Terry Pierce is not joining us. Thank you, Chair. Apologies from Debo Sellis. It clashed with the Devon County meeting, so he had to turn that. Okay, I'm inferior then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, right, so confirmation of minutes, please. So page one, page two. Page three, page four, page five, page six. Everyone okay with those? Happy to note? Thank you very much, everyone. Declarations of interest. Everybody knows how the process works, so does anybody have anything to declare? No, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, right, that brings us on to, uh, does anybody have any urgent business? No. Um, anything for the public forum? Don't see any, I don't see any strangers in the camp. So, so no. Right, so if we move to item six, uh, which is the fusion annual report. So if Lauren Parker, Rob Taylor, Claire Bill. Oh, she's up there, is she? And um, John Parkinson, come forward. If you'd like to sit on the microphones along there, please. And Councillor Leach, you're going to introduce this item. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Just give them a moment to move. Right, Councillor Leach, when you're ready, please. Right. Yeah, apologies for not being there today. That's okay. Oh, I'm, getting, I'm getting feedback. Uh, yeah, you certainly wouldn't want the viruses that I've got at the moment. Uh, right. This report and presentation provides a review of Fusion's performance last year in 2022 and an update on current provision and proposals for the year ahead. The provision of uh, leisure centres is a discretionary service. However, the activities align with the Council's corporate strategy plan. Um, in providing quality service and community well-being. This includes increasing active participation in sport and leisure activities. The government seems to be uh, now taking it quite seriously that sports centres and anything to do with re recreation is extremely important. And it's not only important as far as general uh, health and fitness, but it also is extremely important for social and mental well-being. Uh, hopefully, the report speaks for itself, but before I go into a coughing fit, I'd like to hand it over to uh, John and also the representatives of Fusion to do the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Leach. Hi, I will only let Lauren and uh, we have uh, Rob back as our regional operational manager for Fusion. So they will quickly go through the presentation. I can cover any, any queries on the actual cover report and then obviously uh, any queries from members. Absolutely. OK, thank you.
um, have shown growth in all areas uh, in comparison to the same reporting period of 2021. And so today we will review uh, 2022 and highlight some exciting projects for 2023. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So highlights then from this review, um, participation showed growth month on month. Um, we had quest completion in both centres. We launched new memberships, including staycation and young adult memberships, and we increased opening hours to meet customer demand. So specifically in regards to participation, um, we saw 220,000 participants enter our facilities in 2022 compared to 95,000 in 2021. Now, part of that increase would have been due to a three-month closure in 2021 for COVID. Um, we also launched a new ballet group at Meadowlands in Tavistock. Uh, Parkland supported 90-plus um, referral clients um, on their journey to recovery, and approximately 15 schools uh, enter our facilities in terms of swimming, studio hire, and hall hire. So this, this graph here shows our membership growth in comparison to pre-COVID 2021 and 22. Um, so we are currently tracking it um, almost 90% of pre-COVID figures and uh, 223 more uh, fitness participants in comparison to 2021. Um, we also have Meadowlands who are tracking above pre-COVID figures, which... Um, doesn't fit the general curve of most uh, fitness provision in our industry. Uh, we, this, these numbers are closely supported by the new memberships that we've brought in, um, as I mentioned before, the swim only and the young adult memberships that we have across this contract. So in terms of swim school, um, both centres have shown growth um, in comparison to both pre-COVID and 2021. And we are actually 131% of our pre-COVID figures. Uh, so we're doing, tracking really well on swim school and junior activities. So we also have growth plans in place for uh, the pool setup, for example, marketing and recruitment to grow further beyond these numbers. In terms of Quest then, so Quest is a quality auditing service. Um, we have gained good at Parklands and very good at Meadowlands, um, which post the recovery phase of COVID, those um, scores are very um, impressive. I'm just going to pass over to Rob for the review of NPS. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, firstly, I ought to explain what NPS stands for. It's Net Promoter Score. I'm not sure if colleagues have come across it before, but it's quite a brutal way of, of measuring customer satisfaction. So you're asked a question to um, score out of 10, and 0 to 6 is considered to be a negative score. 7 and 8 is considered to be neutral, and only 9 or 10 is considered to be positive. So when we look at the stats here, when you're reviewing uh, the comments that were made, we need to realise that only nine or a 10 will be a positive outcome for us. So it's quite a harsh method of customer satisfaction. It's great to see the positive comments about the staff, the group exercise and the pool and the equipment. And um, in 30 years of leisure, I've never seen a customer satisfaction report in a leisure centre without showing up the cleanliness and changing room issues that we've got. So that's not to say that I'll ignore it. That is to say that they will become our focus areas, but it comes as no surprise that those are the two areas of concern that we've got and we need to keep our eye on those moving forward. So I, I think that's a really positive uh, result for the whole of 2022.
Okay, so moving across to um, facilities then. So we continue to invest into our facilities, um, whether that be of renewal, repair, um, and off the back of last year's ONS actually, um, in summer 2022, there were a um, significant amount of repairs made to Parklands Leisure Centre. Um, but in addition to that was um, air handling unit repairs, supply and extract fans, replacements, um, fire and intruder alarm, etc., um, as well as uh, replacing lighting to the LED um, energy saving bulbs. So also uh, in 2022, uh, we've spent um, significant amount of money on cleaning supplies, um, deep cleans and equipment. Um, and also there's some measures that we're, we're introducing in terms of solar capital investment that we will um, talk in more depth in a second. And also there's some decarbonisation proposals that we're ongoing discussions, um, uh, as well as sort of local energy saving plans. Okay, so if I can just hand over to Claire, who's our SED and um, Sport and Community Development Officer for the region. Hello, can you see and hear me okay? Yes, Hello? We can, yes, we can hear you, Claire. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. It's just the, the, the connection here. So, yes, yeah, so we just uh, touch on some of the sports community development work. So the exercise referral scheme continued at Parklands. Um, we saw an increase of referrals um, and the Meadowlands scheme were we had an instructor going through training through 2022. So the scheme wasn't running, but pleased to say that that's now been launched um, this this February and we're starting to take referrals in Meadowlands. We did put a bid in um, quite a large bid for uh, falls prevention program which we were unsuccessful, um, but we were um, able to get a member of staff trained in the, um, the PSI, which is the uh, Postural Stability Instructor Training. And I am still progressing um, and exploring opportunities to get further funding to train further staff within that so we can look further at uh, falls prevention work. It's still something we're keen to look into. And then... Um, we have a partnership with OCRA, which continues um, in, in West Devon. So they deliver much of the sports and community development work um, within the district. They, the funding we sort of we provide uh, underpins a lot of their work. So there's a lot of weekly activity sessions at the leisure centre, at the college, um, within the pavilion, and also a wide programme within schools in the Dartmoor mat. Um, they also deliver um, a holiday programme and were successful in 2022 with half funding, the holiday and food um, activity programme program and also started to do some street sports work um, with, with Live West. They've also been successful to get the half funding again for 2023. Um, so that will continue this year. Can't see the slides are not moving on on my screen. So just sort of moving on to the, the, the final slide, um, I think it was more around the events that they deliver. Um, so the, the uh, Sports and Fitness Festival came back again in July with their Super Sunday taster sessions. And there was a number of family events um, delivered by Okra at the Jubilee um, weekend, um, as well as uh, ducking at quite a number of funding bids um, that they were able to deliver. Um, and another funding bid that we've Fusion have been successful going forward um, has been, we're gonna be looking to introduce one-to-one -one funded um, lessons, swimming lessons for children with SEN, so special educational needs and disabilities, which will be a new program moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, here we can see some of our uh, corporate campaigns, um, including the Refer a Friend, <coughs> whereby both parties receive a uh, free month uh, based on to, to increase referrals. And then more locally, um, we our Facebook and inter Instagram interaction is um, commendable. The centres are active on their platforms um, with local and engaging content um, to boast about our facilities and the programmes that we offer to our communities. 
Um, a new slide that we've introduced here. So um, I think it's important to identify that we actually employ um, 116 staff or in 2022 we did, is actually more than that now, um, across the two centres, um, including managers, exercise referral instructors, it, all of the above. Um, we also hold regular MPLQ and um, swim teacher qualifications, uh, with one running in April at Parklands, um, and also 14 of our staff are um, studying additional fundamental skills um, to sort of aid their progression um, within Fusion. There's also a new employee benefit for all of our staff. Uh, they receive free membership as well as their family members in their household. So, good benefit that we've got. Um, okay, so I guess moving forward then, um, if I can just pass on briefly to John in terms of our solar and renewal pro uh, projects that we are... Yes, so we've worked uh, closely with Fusion in regarding to solar panels. So we are now in a position, and Fusion are in a position where there's an appointed contractor, and a timescale is for later, the, well, later this spring and summer for delivery and install. So that's been well, slightly delayed from, from last year. So great news that we're looking to uh, get that delivered, uh, as you say, starting in the, ne in the next few months. The other bit of work that we have been doing is around, uh, with the council, again, support from Fusion, is we've had money from the uh, Low Carbon Skills Fund. So we are now just finalising our sort of individual heat decarbonisation plans for all the centres. So uh, there's been a fair amount of detailed survey work being taking place, and uh, we've got a specialist energy company that's given us sort of detailed plans. That will involve Although we are doing solar energy, it will involve the decommissioning of, of gas, gas boilers and, and looking to replace with uh, air source heat pumps and doing various other insulation and uh, energy efficiency measures. That will be costed out and programmed and we'll be looking to then to put that forward to future funding rounds on the public sector decarbonisation funding. So it's a government initiative and we'll be in a good place for when the next rounds come on board to be submitting bids and see where we can uh, uh, t take those forward. Uh, so, yeah, that's all part of our sort of decolonisation programme. Okay, so in addition, um, in 2023, we are um, going to launch our catering provision. Now, I know that was on the um, 2022 uh, moving forwards, but we are at a point now where we've selected our preferred supplier. We've met with them this morning, including John. Um, and so it's just finalising those smaller items to launch um, Firstly, Meadowlands um, catering provision, um, and then Parklands will follow shortly after. They will run um, events for us as well, so they'll be doing Christmas wreath making, crafts, coffee mornings, etc. They have a fitness background as well, so it completely uh, it fits with our um, vision as well. Um, and then programming wise, so we um, are. We've introduced warm spaces in some of our centres in South Ham, so we're looking to roll that out in West Devon. Um, roller discos have started in Parklands. We're running this girl can training um, towards the end of this month. As Claire stated, we've um, launched exercise referral at Meadowlands now. We facilitate um, regular bookings for the Promise School in Oakhampton. Send swimming lesson funding. Um, as Claire said, uh, we are also part of a Tavistock gift card, the Fiverr Fest, Easter Trail, Paint the Town, um, and um, also we um, have Guy from the Tabby Times um, who is regularly blogging for us um, in return for personal training in our gym. So it's we are doing a lot of fantastic stuff, and 2023 is so exciting. Um, but if I could just um, open it up for questions, please. Councillor Renders, please. I'm the negative. Um, I'm confused. Um, I listened to everything that you said. I read the report. 
thoroughly and it looks fantastic, but it seems to gloss over the one issue that, and if we're here to scrutinise, and I, I know I haven't sat on this committee particularly for a long time, um, but the one thing that seems to be missing from all this is anything financial. And the problems that seem to have ar arisen over the last few years of how that has impacted upon us as a council with funding in there, and it might be something you have to do with the audit committee, I, I get that, but you've given us expenses, it doesn't show us what the overall impact will be on the business itself, and the concern that I have is, although this is great, and, we've, and you, you, um, you know, I could go out tomorrow and get you another thousand people, but all I do is, well, it's a pound here. It, the figures up there just show me how many new members you've got. It doesn't show us an impact on the business as a, as a whole. And the last few years, because of COVID, because of all the other things that you mentioned in it, it doesn't give me any confidence. It gives me confidence that it's, that it's all happy, but I'm sat here going, well, yeah, but that doesn't really tell me anything. It doesn't tell me that the business is going to be sound, given that we're expecting money back into the, to the council moving forwards and we should have had historically. Does that, that makes sense where I'm coming from with this. It's not that I'm criticising what you've done. It sounds great, but it, I don't feel it gives me enough. It doesn't make me think, oh, well, we're safe. Because we have had historical problems. I wanted someone to say to me, and by the way, this is up, that's up, that's up, great. And going forward, we, we see this. And I didn't get that message come across. Sorry to be a slightly negative on that. And I've got a technical question in a bit, but we'll go back to that later. I think Lauren's just passed me the hospital pass there, hasn't she? Uh, no, that's fine. Um, I, I can see your point. That's well made. And um, we will adjust our presentations going forward to give you that confidence. All I can give you at this point of time is, in terms of recovery against the national position, we are ahead of the national average in terms of participation recovery. Participation will drive the financial stability in the centres. And the action plans that Lauren and I have got, short, medium and long term, will be able to demonstrate to you thoroughly that we're in a position that is strong, we're not under threat at all, and we won't be talking about uh, situations of closures, which we've seen in other leisure centres. We're not in that position at all. In fact, we're, we're looking positive for the future. We share the financial figures with John every month, and I'm sure John will will support me in saying I think the future looks really good and I've come back to the contract after a, a three-year hiatus when I was business manager here before I've been to the two centres in the last two weeks and I can't believe the change in attendances participation and the plans moving forward in fact it's, it's given me a warm feeling inside this morning seeing all the plans that I left three years ago coming to fruition now so I think we're in a really positive place what I will do is I'll make sure that our slides represent that next time we present. May I just say that as well as Mr Parkinson meeting monthly with um, Fusions officers, your head of finance meets with Mrs Buckle, our financial advisor for this, and the conversations go through there. So. West Devonborough Council are completely on top of the situation. Um, but yes, you're quite right. It maybe should show on the slides so us lesser mortals know what's going on. Um, but just to reassure you that Mrs Buckle does have that meeting with their head of finance at Fusion Head Office. Just wasn't sure what we were scrutinising, that was all. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm a bit worried about the fact that cleanliness, changing rooms and showers are all rather in the red. Um, these, I think, are items, if there's a sort of bug in the system, presumably these items could perhaps spread it a bit more than any other items. I realise that you've said that there is a, a daily cleaning process um, and I'm not quite sure why those are still as red as they are. Uh, I think, Councillor, a, a lot of it is subjective. So a warm shower to you might not be a warm shower to me. So there's an element of that involved in it. There's an element of if someone's dropped a tissue out of their pocket and I follow on from them, they're going to consider that change room dirty and, and that's the sort of truth of the matter. And there's an element of us 
needing to pick up our service provision as well. We need to listen to what our customers are saying and do something about it. And those two areas will be the areas that I focus on in terms of the MPS process and picking those up and making sure that we're doing everything we can to deliver on that service provision. But it, it is an element of subjectivity to it. It's not as clear cut. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to add, I went to um, Meadowlands last Tuesday and met with Nick, the manager, and um, I went round, and I have to say, it was really clean. Um, and they haven't even started that morning's cleaning routine. They were just about to start. You have to hear it. <laughs> to give some feedback on that, I did get them to get the cleaning equipment out this morning. It wasn't as clean as it should have been. So we are on it. <laughs> okay, so Councillor Hayworth, please. I'm just wondering, you know, you're bringing in caterers. Are you, uh, have you briefed them about providing healthy food for children and so on? Uh, yes. So, as I say, they're from a fitness background. Um, so, there will be an element of fun food off the back of a fun family swim. Um, but they, they will also be providing uh, protein shakes and things that are suitable for post-workout as well, recovery, etc. So, they are both from a fitness background. They know exactly how many milligrams of protein that you should be having post-workout. So, there will be an element of um, different... So often, I mean, if you go to a, a hospital, you'll march through, you know, stacks of Mars bars, and there's no hint of a salad in sight, and I just... Um, okay. Thank you. This is arguably the fittest couple I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. They're, they're you know, they're, they are uh, TV personalities, so they, they've both been on uh, ITV representing health and well-being, so they are, yeah, frustratingly very healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Right, Councillor Kemp now, please. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Claire. Um, Councillor Southcott, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, looking at your cost of running, um, recently down in Cornwall there was an item on television which related to using servers to heat the water. Are you considering that at all? Yeah, the installation was in Exmouth, uh, the, one that I, the one that I saw. But yeah, it looked like a really good uh, technology setup, and it happened to be an ex-boss of mine. So I've booked a meeting in with him, and uh, he's taking a lot of credit for it, but it wouldn't have been him. We know that the council officers have already made contact with uh, Leisure Energy is the company. Leisure Energy is the company. And we've already made contact with them, and we'll be... Uh, bringing them in to assess whether or not that would impact our pools here. So, yeah, it's, it looked like a really good innovation to me. Mr. Brook. Oh, yeah. Hello. Um, just to build on that, um, yeah, we've absolutely been in touch with them. And if it just for wider information, the offer they have is where somebody wants to take up a, a, a cloud data storage solution. So someone has to basically have a need so like the council or fusion, but probably some quite big computational requirement in a cloud format, then there is a need for a data center. And then if they need that, then the data center can be located. Their clever bit is the fact they've, they've worked out that they get hot. And that's their innovation. And then they just pipe the heat into the pool. So there has to be two things. There has to be um, a pool somewhere handy, which tick, we've got six of them, well, four, two here and four in South Hams. But there also has to be a company somewhere that's prepared to get their checkbook out that needs a cloud data solution. So um, it's a joining of the dots that is required. So we're all on it because it'd be quite interesting. Um, but just thought I'd share that with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brook. Councillor Southcott, excellent question. <laughs> Molly, you. Mem members first. Chair. No, go on. Um, you talked about the um, swim school membership being increasing more than it was pre-COVID. Just wondered what you put that down to. Is that marketing? Is it why do you think it's increased? And do you think it will carry on increasing? That's my first question. Um, so off the back of COVID, I believe that um, there was an increase in junior activities. You know, there were three years 
where children didn't have um, that facility to go swimming lessons. So um, it's not just our swim school that has seen a peak in junior activities, it's, it's any other provision that we provide. Um, so I'm not confident. I, th I feel like we, are, we have reached our peak for the time being, and that's why we need to uh, redesign the layout of our swimming and programs, um, recruit more. Um, so I think we, we peaked to a certain um, aspect, but we will continue to grow. Um, obviously, it's difficult with the cost of living, but I, I feel like we are certainly going, it's still, still going in the right direction. May I ask my second question? Uh, this one is probably less easy. Um, picking up on the cleanliness point of view, so if you've got complaints about cleanliness now and you've got more and more people coming in to use the centres, how are you going to wrestle with effectively an environment that people think are not clean, more people coming in, potentially making it less clean? How are you going to manage that? Better systems in place to start with, which is what we're implementing now, and more staffing resource to manage the issue. That, that, those are the two straightforward things that we need. Thank you. Councillor Kemp, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm going back to a subject that we were covering before, which was non um, non coal and the non um, uh, 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 that, uh, new kinds of energy, bringing in clean energy for your facilities. How long do you think it would be before you are totally clean energy? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I mean, as a council, obviously we're working through with our climate change policy and our you know climate change specialists. So I know we've been working closely, particularly on our on the solar energy aspect. As you say, it's been delivered and installed by Fusion, but it's obviously been supported by ourselves as a, as a borough council. Uh, what we need to see then is obviously, yeah, that, that reduction in, in the carbon footprint. And uh, so I can't give you an exact figure in time at the moment, but we are working, as I say, with one of the leading sort of leisure energy specialists. So through our work that we've got now through the Low Carbon Skills Fund, we will have, I say, an individual uh, decarbonisation plan for each of our leisure centres. That will dovetail reduction in energy. So I guess at some point we can see that timeline of, of working to as, as low as possible or whatever net zero we can, we can reach to. But there needs to be other measures that are introduced to our, our centres to enable that to, to take place. So, so I'm, I'm paraphrasing that. About 10 years or...? I can't give you a, 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 a date right. line on it, but obviously it's, it's what we're working towards. So I would hope uh, this time next year, if we've been successful and, and gone through, we'll be able to be more uh, accurate in that sort of time, time scale of how long it will take. Yeah. That, that obviously of great interest to the council itself. I mean, it's obviously a big question. Thank you. Mr. Brook is going to give you a bit more of an answer by the look of it. Sorry, Chair, I can't help myself. Uh, I should know better. Um, we're, uh, we're all aligned to this, and it's really great that Fusion in with John's support and you know the council support have got ourselves into the position we're in. But just a, a sort of a minor reflection of reality, which is that whilst there is government funding available for this, it has a large matched funding element. So if you have to spend six million pounds on a leisure centre and you've got to stump up twenty percent as a council, um, that's a really big number. So there's the art of the possible, and then there's the art of the kind of financially sustainable and we all want to get to the end and we will but how quickly and when we fund it and who funds it are the challenging hurdles that we're all going to collectively have to learn to jump over so that that's probably why we can't answer the question any more clearly than when we have in this space thank you um, mr brooke mr parkinson Rob and lauren i don't know who's going to answer this but because meadowlands is quite old already does it have a lifespan as to whether, you know, as you've said, if you've got six million project um, and you've got to stump up the 20%, that's a lot of money. And is it then worth investing in Meadowlands? It is a good question. And leisure centres and pools do have a lifespan. 
Uh, and in fact, the work that the LGA has done, and I know uh, our leader of the council here, through that, the lobbying to government about having funding to replace all the leisure centres. I mean, the leisure centres typically 25, 30 years. Well, I think in several of our sites, we're past that uh, it, it here and, and in Southampton. So you're right, it's, the, it's that equation of do you spend X amount on the refurbishment or at some point uh, a new facility? Obviously, what we have done at Meadowlands is, is had that sort of uh, position where we've had to invest to keep the centre sustainable and, and uh, allow it to uh, attract additional income through dry side facilities. Well, a lot of that money didn't really do a lot to the swimming pool itself, it did to the changing room. So we still need to be looking at how to improve and invest in, in, in some of our provision. And you're right, there, there needs to be that sort of uh, equation of you know investing refurbishment or something new. But at the moment, we see a way forward of a, enhancing the existing existing facilities. And, and having further money to do decarbonisation will help that sort of uh, older swimming pool be sustainable, yeah. Um. Rob, um, but just going from there, because Exeter's swimming pool that they had for donkey's years, the, I can't, the one not by Sainsbury's, the other one, um, that the Exeter um, Swimming Club, yeah. But that has been completely revamped. It is the most energy saving and everything. I mean, it's, it's, I haven't seen it, but I've read articles about it and it's completely state of the art. So, do we end up going sort of down that road or do Exeter City just have lots of money? Well, I won't want to say what another council did, but obviously it costs a lot of money to provide a brand new facility. And that is the, the you know, particularly now, you know, the climate now costs have gone up. So building a new provision is, is very costly. But, you know, we will need lots of funding scenarios and partnerships to it to, to enhance that. Also, just as a last point on when we're talking about energy efficiencies and possible funding, and I know through uh, DCMS and, and, and the LGA, so we have got a, 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 a one-off window of money from the, in the budget announcement of, of 60 odd million nationally. Uh, that is for local authority run uh, swimming pools and leisure centres. So we've just seen that announcement, but obviously the detail of how we apply for how much and the process is still to follow. But as I said, we'll be in a good place to put our bids forward. And as soon as those uh, applications and details come out, we'll be looking at it straight, straight away. Yeah, I was just going to add, uh, in terms of looking at future investment in the leisure centres and the improvement of leisure centres, the one thing that's true is it will always be measured on demand and how busy the current leisure centre is, and what the participation is like and what the community engagement is like. So our real function in terms of projecting where we are in leisure needs to be to keep that leisure centre thriving as it is at the moment. Because any assessment, any needs assessment on a new facility, new investments, will be based on the number of people that we've got on the demand. So that's that's where I see us sitting. Councillor Jury, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to add that I have been had the privilege of going to the new leisure centre in Exeter at St Sidwell's Point, and it's amazing. Um, it's the country's first passive house uh, leisure centre. Uh, I know the excess. Bit of, bit of a strange thought, but the excess heat from the gym goes into heating the pool. Um, very clever. The cost, as I understand it, was £44 million. Yes, it's incredible. Um, Councillor Southcott, please. Thank you, Chair. I uh, just want to go back a little bit to the solar panels you're putting on. What core capacity is that going to be? Is it, go is it going to be high enough capacity that you're going to have any excess or is it all going to be consumed through every day or would there be the need to you put in some battery storage for peak generation time to smooth it out all the energy that will be used will be used on site so the, the solar panels that will be going on is purely for the existing uh, energy uses that there's no looking at the moment to sort of as, as you've indicated additional that could be looked at in the future, but at the moment in time, it's just serving the sort of use of that facility. Thank you. Um, 
Councillor Spettigue, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, a question to all three of you, really. Um, I think when the Meadowlands reopened after COVID, there was a across the board price increase for membership. I don't recall the figure, I'm afraid. But look, considering the 10% increase that's coming in May, what, have you thought about how that might impact your, uh, your participation in terms of the cost of living crisis? So in line with um, our competitors, we have um, an industry, as an, as an industry, we have noticed um, sort of 11% increase. So we're kind of coming in just below that. Um, and I think it's required to um, enable us to be sustainable moving forward. Um, we have considered drop-offs, um, but I think overall, it's a direction, unfortunately, we're going to have to travel in to, to remain operational in our communities. Councillor Daniel, please. Councillor Daniel, you should have been May, may I just add on oh. further to that one, actually? Um, so we're actually looking to implement some bespoke memberships to um, offset the increase. So where we might um, offer a gym only package, um, increase our concessionary um, benefits. So we are very mindful that yes, we might lose some people, but actually can we win the back with another product? Councillor Daniel. My question was, um, there's quite a stark difference between membership in Meadowlands to Parklands in Oakhampton. And we know Oakhampton is a fairly you know, less wealthy place than Tavistock. And um, given price increases coming along as well, what are you going to do to improve customer engagement in the Parklands catchment area? So I guess um, partly through the bespoke memberships that I've just alluded to, but also looking at the product. So um, Meadowlands offer um, much more of an enhanced product in comparison to Parklands in terms of their group exercise programme. The recruitment at Meadowlands has been much easier um, because of the um, catchment from Plymouth. Um, so I guess it's looking at A, the product and the recruitment, which we are definitely going in the right direction for with um, Parklands. We are seeing a difference in the last, well, in this year period already. Um, and we are very um, mindful of that. Um, uh, I think it's worth noting as well that Parklands leads the company in terms of the MPS score. They've got the highest score within Fusion. So when I was there last week, I noticed that every single person came through the door with a big smile on their face and was waving to the staff. And that's actually borne out through the MPS score. So what we now need to do is improve the service in terms of the pool programming, the gym programming and the exercise class programming and be able to get more people in through that route. I, I'm, I'm really confident that we can take Parklands to the next level. I think something that we haven't done for a number of years um, since pre-COVID is also marketing. So um, it's something that I've um, just launched uh, this month is some swim school bespoke marketing material um, as well as fitness provision. And I'll, I've also... Um, just brought in uh, an Ivy Bridge specific pamphlet and I'm looking to roll that out at all of our centres to say to our um, local communities, this is what we offer. You know, we're not just fusion. We are your park at Oakhampton Leisure Centre and this is what we can offer for you and your family. So it's something that I'm working on behind the scenes. Councillor Turnbull, please. Uh, yeah, just going back to uh, the cafes, which you were obviously planning trying to open, starting with Meadowlands. Um, is there a target date or a roadmap that um, we can have, please? 
Yeah, so we are actually working towards launching Meadowlands um, 30th of April. Um, they're currently, you may or may not have noticed, if you follow us on Facebook, um, they have their pop-up coffee shop outside the front at the moment between peak hours, um, just to gauge what our customers um, want in terms of um, opening hours and menu choice. So they are collating all of the feedback um, as we speak. But our timescale, we're looking... We're working towards the 30th of uh, April. Parklands, I would like to say um, in time for our summer holidays. Um, that may be a little bit um, <laughs> promising, but we're working towards it. Thank you. Now for some of mine. Um, the air handling unit, it had a really good overhaul when um, you had to shut for a little while. But there are still big problems with condensation within the centre. Like, you know, I, I suggested to Nicky remove the television the other day because you can see where the water drips down um, and it's not used, so it's better off the wall, out of the way. Um, but there are still, you know, quite a lot of ceiling tiles that aren't looking so clever. Um, and I know some have been swapped around because I noticed that bit. But, you know, it is still a cause of concern, the condensation, because you've had to remove all the hair dryers for safety because of that issue. So is there any more that you can do to alleviate some of the condensation? So actually, the damage that you're referring to is pre that repair. So um, Nick has... A with the help of our technician, ordered some more ceiling tiles. That needs redecoration in that area as well. And then the hair dryers, we've just ordered 10 new ones, which will sit on the walls um, in case of any uh, further disruption to the air handling unit. Um, so they won't need to be removed next time because they'll be out um, of that reach. Um, but we have some spare air handling unit belts in now. We have a lot of spare parts. So should it fail, we can... Uh, jump on the case a little bit quicker. Um, my next one was, with all the work that Okra do with um, Parklands, etc., and the team working that they have there, which is extremely successful, Okra do come out to some of the schools in the Tavistock side, but is there any plans to work together a bit more? So... Okra can come out and do more work in Tavistock. I will declare an interest because it's my friend who does it, but I don't understand since Tavistock lost its version of Okra that nothing has come out of the woodwork that could work alongside. Yeah, I'm smiling away because Lauren knows that this is a bugbear of mine as well. So the contract uh, is up for renewal in July. And part of that renewal process will be to discuss what is coming to Medlands in terms of direct provision. Because it, it does seem to be that it's focused on the Parklands Leisure Centre. For obvious reasons, I suppose, they're based there. But, um, yeah, we'll renegotiate the contract in July and that will be firmly on the agenda. And the other one I'd just like to end on is a real positive is the ballet classes. When I first saw they were coming out, I thought, oh, on the earth, it's going to go to ballet in the, uh, in the gym type of thing. But the classes, there's about half a dozen classes a week, and they're asking for more. So hopefully some of these children that are coming, you know, the parents may bring another child who could then maybe have a swim membership or something like that. So there is crossover, but the success of the ballet is just beyond belief. Um, and, and when I went, the gym was well used. All classes these days are totally booked out. I don't know whether that's the same for Parklands, but it's definitely the case in Meadowlands. So, you know, thank you for bringing your report forward um, and for taking all of our questions. I think, Mr Mullen, you might agree we gave you a bit more of a South Hams grilling today than is normal. Um, but thank you very much, and I wish you the best of luck going forward, and I know I'll see you both. Um, but thank you for coming to Council as often as you do, and for being so open where you possibly can. 
Um, so thank you very much for that. And if thank I you. can ask members that we note uh, the contents and progress of Fusion's annual report for 22 and proposals for 23. May I have a second to please to note? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, guys. So the next item is Chris Shears and Councillor Crozier, the item that had to be deferred from the last meeting. Got to get that in. You don't want to say why. <laughs> okay. That's why I didn't say why. I knew he was on holiday. <laughs> and Councillor Crozier obviously forgot us. Um, I, I had a very sore throat and cold, oh, right. and I didn't want to bring my ger germs to the council chamber. Okay, I actually then. joined you online, but yeah, I, I knew you were sort of here. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> I was here in one sense of the word. Thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair. We bring this uh, update to you on the economy package and the West Devon thematic plan. Um, it's a great success of what we've been doing. We're I, we're, we're on top of right, lost my place. Moved. Here we are. Yeah. <coughs> Activities on track. Eleven. One. We're at risk of not completing. I'll start with the one that we're not going to complete, which is the Eco Museum. The Eco Museum hasn't attracted any uh, third-party funding, uh, and so for that reason alone is probably going to be absorbed by the active travel uh, initiative and uh, be accommodated there. Uh, the Eco Museum was as much to do with a beautiful countryside and the industrial presence within that countryside. And uh, although very fascinating for some, it did not tick the boxes of a lot of the funders. Uh, we go on from there and um, it, it gives us, uh, or it gives me much pleasure to say that the engagement on the broadband side is uh, moving apace now. In fact, um, my predecessor, Rick Cheadle, uh, all, all the houses in his road have been connected bar him. You wonder why? There's an electric pole which they have to attach their cable to, and they need um, permission from NGED. Uh, to use that pole in order to carry the cable to his house. Likewise, I have a similar situation, whereas my next door neighbour up the road um, has been connected a couple of weeks ago, and I've got no idea when I'm going to be connected. So, you know, it, 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 is, it is happening now, and uh, we're very pleased to hear it. Um, the... Um, the uh, Oakhampton Transport Hub has secured its funding, which we're very pleased to hear. And also we've got money available for business, um, uh, bespoke business support uh, for, uh, the, um, for the business community, including agriculture as well. The um, Oakhampton business community, we're supporting them in trying to set up a business forum uh, that is moving forward. It is slow, but we are getting there. Um, we're moving towards a referendum shortly. Um, the the um, in all, I'm happy to uh, tell you that everything has been going on at a pace. Uh, in particular, the uh, uh, Visit uh, Devon website is up and running. Um, it has been populated as we speak still. Um, it's got a very good section on Dartmoor, and they hopefully are now populating it with the AMB and other districts within the community. Um, Chairman, I'll leave it there as far as I'm concerned and pass over to um, our uh, officer, Chris Shears. 
Thank you. And um, yeah, so I don't know how you wanted to do this. Um, if you, I, I'm more than happy to, to simply ask if there's any questions about the report that you've had before you and to, to respond to those. Thank you, Chair. Um, my um, question is about uh, broadband connectivity and fibre. Um, I, I'm councillor for South Taunton Ward, which is very rural. I mean, a lot of poor connectivity presently. Um, we've been offered a plan from Jurassic Fibre, but this is totally a commercial project. We won't be getting any other funding for that. And it will only go ahead if enough local people sign up. And you know, my concern is if we don't get enough people signing up, where does that leave us? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's a there's a variety of means that um, that connecting Devon and Somerset are, are relying on to, to deliver high speed broadband to rural areas. Um, one of which is the um, purely commercial option. Um, and so, so Gemma Bristow, who is um, currently dealing with active travel and with digital infrastructure, um, is working collaboratively with different partner organisations um, to try and unlock getting services into some of our most rural communities because we, we recognise that with a, with a national target of um, 95 to 98% to delivery, um, down here in Devon, a lot of our rural communities fall within that sort of 5% that are, that are deemed hard to deliver. And so, so it's our, so it's part of Gemma's work is encouraging them and um, trying to negotiate to get them into those most rural communities. Um, that's not a, an easy task because um, connecting Devon and Somerset are not very um, open with the, the data that they have in terms of rollout um, opportunities and um, so, so a lot of the work that's going on is around that. Um, but we're also um, looking at potential projects that we can tap into the, the LEP to get additional support for. Um, and so, so hopefully we'll have some, some more positive opportunities for our most rural communities in the not too distant future. Um, but at the moment, you're right, it's about where, where they are looking at um, commercial delivery of um, high-speed broadband. And they're, they're talking about you know, having to have a, um, the, um, a critical mass of, um, of interested parties then I guess that our role in that scenario is to, to encourage people to, to take it up if possible um, so that we do reach that critical mass and get it into those communities. And I add to that the fact that there is a relationship between the distance between the particular households that need to be joined up. If the distance is too great between two households, they won't get it. But if there's somebody in the middle that might make all the difference. But quite literally, if you go over 70 metres, they're not interested. I can tell you uh, that in the Weir Key area, they're delivering within 200 metres of Weir Key where there's a do another dozen customers, but they won't fill the gap. And, and just, to, just to add to that as well, that um, uh, some time ago, um, connecting Devon and Somerset were looking at alternative means than purely fibre connectivity. So they were looking at things like point-to-point um, -point transmission that would allow them to, to bridge distances in a more cheap um, and um, effective way for, for s small pockets of um, rural communities. But, um, but I, I, um, I don't believe that that has progressed significantly and they, they are still reliant more heavily on the, the fibre rollout. Thanks very much. Not first, Councillor Moy did. Um, thank you. Um, action TE 1.3, promote active travel, cycling, horse riding and walking uh, routes across West Devon. Just a comment, really. Um, where riding is concerned, if you have a horse, you usually stable it where there is an active um, riding arena somewhere. Um, if you want to travel further afield, you need a horse that will go in a horse box. Mine doesn't. <laughs> um, and all these things, um, I'm a great believer in single lane roads where people like to ride, walk and cycle, um, needs a much lower speed limit. I mean, going along 60, it's just ridiculous. It's one of my fads, I'm afraid. Yeah, 
duly, duly noted. Um, so, so at, at the moment, because we've commissioned the um, local, link, local cycling and walking infrastructure plan, um, there will be a, a range of different projects that um, spill out of that piece of work. Um, so, so the the um, the organisation, the consultants that we've commissioned to do that, um, we finalised the agreement with them um, about a week ago, and so they're they're now in the the prep phase to to start their their delivery of that piece of work. Um, and I'll make a, a note to ensure that um, horse riding is considered as part of the work that they're doing. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Kemp, please. Hayworth, please. You've both got bobs today. Rose by any other name. Um, back to broadband. Um, all around me, um, people are getting broadband. And I thought, oh, happy day. Um, but I, then I got a phone, I, I changed BT and then I got a phone call. And because uh, Chagford is, the exchange is overloaded, um, we'd have to go to Oakhampton, which is 14 miles. And I was given a quote of £720 a week or a month. Anyway, it was enough to make me fall in a kind of state of sadness. Um, so it just, and then apparently we're going to lose the analog option. And what happens to those of us who are just left in a, in a void? I'm, I'm not sure that I'm able to answer that question as, no, part, as part of this group, but, um, but it, it, is, it is something that we will, we will look to raise with con connecting Devon and Somerset. Can I just make a suggestion um, that in the new council, would it be worth asking members um, or in their wards to actually sort of know where some of the really bad parts are and to let Gemma know? I think that might be more helpful. And when people are out canvassing, you know, it is worth a question if you're prepared for a long time on the doorstep, I should imagine, uh, with people's wrath on the subject. But I think it's something that would help Gemma going forward in the next council if we ask everybody, and particularly rural members, you know, they know of bad patches. I mean, I can think in, uh, you know, Lidford, there's not great places for signal. Um, and, you know, where I'm working at the moment in Beer Ferris is terrible. Um, so I think it may be worth an ask of members to submit to Gemma um, areas that they've come across that are really bad for broadband and you know what can be done about it. Thank you. Um, we did set up a community champions, which all members were asked to uh, supply people who would um, engage. Uh, we do know where a lot of these black spots are already. They're off the map as far as the current plan goes. Um, it's extremely frustrating. And I agree with the point that was made over there about di digital connectivity. Um, it isn't complete magic. Um, our Paris Council has a digital connection now for its phone. We're only getting about 50% service. Right. Thank you. Uh, Mr Molyneux. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I've just been listening to the debate, and I, and I think it reflects that, um, actually, the government doesn't realise how important... We, we talk about this is about thriving economy, and clearly connectivity, be it broadband connectivity, rail connectivity, road connectivity, is key to West Devon. I think the government is caught between the two strands of commerciality and ensuring that residents have a service and they keep going back to they need commercial providers to deliver this. And of course, to get commercial providers engaged in the broadband, they, they need to compromise on the commercial providers call the tune because otherwise they won't do it if there's no money for them. Um, so, so that's the challenge. But I think, I think getting back to making sure that the government understands how important digital connectivity is as part of thriving economy, I think is the key thing that we as West Devon Borough Council need to do. And I suggest, and I know our, one of our MPs, Geoffrey Cox, is, is you know, hot on the broadband connectivity issue. And I, I would suggest that we might want to 
spell that out to our MPs. I don't know um, what the leader thinks of that idea. We, we get a nod from the leader, so that's... Yeah, I agree entirely, and it is something we have raised with Sir Geoffrey in particular. Um, obviously, we've got the normal connections with CDS uh, and so on, and there are new funding streams happening, so we need to be on top of that and make sure that we uh, we can deliver. So, totally in favour. Thank you, Mr Molyneux. Councillor Kemp. Thank you, Chair. Now, uh, this is related to promoting, promoting active travel in our areas that are, as other councillors have pointed out, often have very narrow roads, very old towns, buildings that are close to each other. And ironically, in an age or in a place where there are sometimes problems with, um, with internet, there doesn't seem to be problems with GPS telling lorries to come through the middle of small towns. Now, I am bringing this to you and mentioning it here because I've mentioned it all over. I've gone to all other people. Is there, obviously, if you have congestion and you have vehicles too big for the infrastructure, you are not getting uh, 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 your, your thriving economy working. You are slowing everything down. Is there a way to uh, uh, to intervene, to make use, to, to pass on information, whereby there can be councilly, councilly, council-led um, uh, 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 routes around problem areas? I I can't speak with regards to um, sort of main forms of. of sort of lorries and um, other pieces of transport infrastructure, but certainly in terms of active travel, then we're, we're looking at making um, areas more accessible, so to help people get from A to B without relying on a, on a car or other vehicle. So that's, that's a key part of the local cycling and walking infrastructure plan. But I think you touch upon a, a really valid point there by, by mentioning about transport infrastructure, because um, for, for any economy to thrive, you have to have at least one of knowledge infrastructure, which can be educational facilities or internet connectivity and um, access to the internet, um, or, or you need logistics infrastructure in place so that people can get from A to B, or ideally the, the best places to invest for, for making a thriving economy. You have both of those things in place, and um, a lot of our areas struggle to have even one of those. Isn't, that is not a, an issue that's on your horizon at the moment, then? It's, it's more a... It's more a challenge about how you actually address that within a rural community, particularly with logistics infrastructure. So if you're talking about transport infrastructure, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking at um, the installation of a new road, for example, then there's a, there's a, a real challenge to, to draw down the significant funding that is required to, to implement that. So, so there's, there's, there's huge challenges involved with, with putting transport infrastructure in place, which is why people tend to focus in rural communities on improving the knowledge infrastructure as far as possible. Yes, because I wasn't talking about building more roads. I was just talking about flagging for different parts of the community the best way that they can go, or flagging when there is somewhere they shouldn't go. Councillor Moyes, please. Yes, sorry, just slightly to answer, um, Claire. Um, <clears throat> Lidford, uh, the route through Lidford um, is a sort of shortcut, and we were heartily fed up with huge lorries coming through. Um, and luckily, we have a bridge. Um, and of course, they decided that the bridge couldn't possibly take these huge, heavy lorries, made it to a single track, and it's made all the difference. So, yeah, maybe that. <laughs> I can answer that one because I've been in touch with the, the county council and they say unless there is actual road infrastructure that is under threat that belongs to them, they're not going to do anything, you're lucky you had a bridge. Right. Does anybody... Councillor Daniel, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think at our last meeting I mentioned having a, a tr an integrated transport plan for the whole of West Devon where we looked at these issues because we, we look at things... If, piecemeal it seems and I think the certainly the economy um, section of our thematic um, program that that's something that they could take on I think and, and I, know, I know it's a big piece of work and I know you'd probably have to do it in relation with 
Devon County Council, but I think it's well worth doing because if we want a vision for the future of our area where people can get around safely without getting in a car, then that's what it's need. Then that's what's needed, and to prioritise active travel over more roads and more tra transport that way, if we can. Thank you. And and that's that's exactly what we're doing. So um, the the local cycling and walking infrastructure plan um, is going to be looking at exactly that, where the priorities are and where where it's possible for us to to achieve quick wins by removing barriers that are preventing people from using active and inclusive travel options. Um, but I, I take on board your point. We're also working with Devon County, exploring opportunities around public transport and um, making that more accessible to people in rural communities as well. Kimber, please. Thank you very much. I was looking at the inward investment campaign, and I understand it's difficult to persuade businesses to move into the area um, unless we've got vacant business units for them to move into. But is there any evidence of demand for commercial units from existing West Devon businesses? We, we don't tend to, to deal with um, those sorts of inquiries directly at the moment. Um, that a lot of our business inquiries, for particularly around growth, um, tend to go through the contract that we have with BIP. Um, so there are units up near where BIP are based in Oakhampton, for example, and um, there's a there's a lot of interest in the the new units that were were constructed up there. Um, and so so I think that there there is evidence that there is demand for for new commercial spaces. The other thing to to bear in mind is that within the the um, JLP, for example, um, what you found is that the, the employment sites came forward for development incredibly quickly through that and, um, and where they have been built out, they're full already um, or, or have significant numbers of inquiries to get businesses into those units. And so, um, so yeah, so it's important that we identify um, future sites for commercial development um, so that we can continue to attract new businesses but also facilitate the growth of existing businesses. Um, I, I think that's a, a good point. Um, and, yeah, so... So there's, a, there's also a, a question around that where um, we did have a, an objective, um, TE 1.1, which is looking at a, a visitor economy plan, and um, there was a, a budget allocated to that, and one of the things that we're um, looking to propose in the, in the near future is that instead of looking at the, the visitor economy and um, trying to, to promote that further, that we look at developing an inward investment strategy for the area um, so that we do start to identify where key opportunities are for, for bringing um, new business and growing businesses so that they're able to expand within West Devon. Does anybody have any further questions on this report? Councillor Daniel. Could I make a comment, please, Chair? You may General indeed. Call. Thank you. Um, my, I feel that we do not have enough advisory group meetings because I wasn't aware that we'd had an economy one before this, this presentation. And um, I would have liked to have been involved in that as part of the advisory group. And I think it's something that our next council should be looking at that we should have at least six advisory group meetings in a year and not two because I don't know about anyone else but I don't feel at all involved in this today so thank you um, it's just a comment and uh, you know it's no no criticism of you but that's that's the way it was set up but I feel that we need to be looking at that carefully because we as councillors all need to be involved in what's going on and what the plans are being made and come up with other ideas which is our um, role thank you um, Madam Chairman, um, it's very interesting you've gone on that tack. Um, of the members of the advisory group for the economy, we have very few actually attend, but we do get a lot of other councillors. I think the last economy advisory committee, we had 10 councillors on it, and there was three from that panel. So there was a lot of interest on a wide basis. Mr Molyneux, please. Um, uh, what I would say, Chair, is, and, and to the members of the committee, is that um, the Hub Committee and as the senior leadership team met to talk about how the advisory groups might work going forward in the new council. So we, we had a conversation about um, things that they should be looking at in terms of being much more forward-looking. There's a tendency at the moment that... Um, the advisory groups just tend to review reports that are then going to come to overview and scrutiny committee. And actually, the whole idea was about sort of looking outwards uh, at potential 
policy for the future rather than what's happening now. Um, so we will be sort of the the, uh, the the view, depending of course on who gets elected, is that we will carry on with the advisory groups but reinvigorate them into a slightly different focus in the new council. It is certainly how I've tried to run the economy group, to push the boundaries rather than uh, just stay with the status quo because you know business needs space, businesses expand, etc., etc. Right, thank you everyone. Um, may I just ask that we're happy to note the progress in delivering against the plan for West Devon thriving economy thematic delivery plan. Everybody in agreement, please? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crozier, and thank you, Mr Shears. Thank you very much. Do we know where Councillor Radcliffe is? Is it? Um, right, the next item on the agenda is uh, a plan for West Devon thematic update, Improving Homes, uh, by Mrs Blake. Um, and if you would like to lead forward, please, Mrs Blake. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, hopefully the paper is self-explanatory. Um, we have two of the activities within the um, theme on track and another four uh, where there have been delays, not all within our control. Um, I've written the lists of achievements there uh, with, with, with the support of uh, Councillor Ratcliffe of things that we have done this, this past 12 months. Um, and hopefully through the regular uh, updates that we've done on the housing crisis to the to, to the hub committee and the, and the reports that we've written, members feel that they are, are, are quite uh, clued up with what's going on in, in, in the world of housing in West Devon. Happy to take any questions about any of the actions. Councillor Kimber, please. Just a couple of questions. I see the housing needs surveys. There's a lot of um, parishes listed there. What's the process for getting onto that list? The process is, is evidence-led. So we look at numbers on the housing register, uh, numbers of, uh, of potential sites, properties that we've got, um, and uh, really it's a, it's, we're developing a matrix which we can share with members as to what what uh, criteria meets to get, there is to, to meet that, to get onto the list. We, what we've done, and you will see in the list here, is arrange them into cluster groups. Um, we recognise with some of our rural parishes that actually finding sites for, for, for any development can be really challenging, um, but yet there is a natural cluster in which people might consider moving and still be able to sustain the, the, the communities and their involvements in that community, hence why we've looked at cluster, clustering them that way. So, thank you. So you talked about it's difficult to identify sites. I think I, I think I was interested in community-led housing projects, and would like to speak to lo local landowners. And I think at one stage we were, we asked if we could put together like a crib sheet so we could speak to landowners intelligently and not say stupid things to them. I just wonder if it would be possible to have that. Yes, we have actually, we've got one, uh, we've got a draft with the design team at the moment, we're hoping to circulate that to, to, to members very soon so that they've got a crib sheet, we'd like to share it wider with parish councils and neighbourhood planning groups so that actually if there is interest that they've got some, some basic information and they know where to go for, 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 for further information. We're also looking at a survey to send out to um, parish, parish councils as to whether they're interested in, in, in working um, to, to set up whether there's any interest locally in setting up a, a community land trust and then look at what look at what that comes back and says and, and be led by the evidence as to what we want to do next. Councillor Moyes, please. Um, how long ago was the survey done in Brentor 
um, because I think the result um, showed far less than when it was done a few years ago. Um, and there was a project uh, that we were hoping to get through for about think, 10 houses in a particular area. I think that was done uh, last April uh, and we had the results of that and that was at the, uh, ex the hub committee in January where we decided that we wouldn't progress a direct delivered site at Brentor. Um, we are looking, as you can see, uh, around clustering the housing need together um, with Lidford, Mary Tavy and Peter Tavy to understand the need in a wider area. <clears throat> Seems very sensible. Councillor Daniel, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is one that I've brought up in the past about the sale of social housing. Um, and you were going to talk to Live West about their policy. I wonder if you've got any um, success with that. Thanks. So straight after the um, hub committee uh, ooh, at the beginning of, of March, uh, we had a conversation with Live West um, where they, dis that they said that they would share some wider information about their proposals um, and that we, we could work together about identifying those properties, what we might do with them, whether there was some opportunity to look at bringing them up to standard jointly using some of our um, funding uh, for, for, for um, home improvements and just a much more transparent conversation and for us to understand their thoughts on a, on a, on a, on a longer term basis, a sort of 10 year basis. Um, can we stop them doing it? No. Um, but can we, can, can we act? Can we do things together? Potentially. Um, particularly when it's the last few properties in a rural area. Um, yeah. So we are having conversations. For us, it's Live West uh, predominantly um, that, 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 that's considering disposals on account of them being the, the, the largest landlord and, of course, having all our older stock, uh, which is harder for them to bring up to, to, to a standard in which they can continue to let it. So, uh, I brought, this was brought up at the Parish Council in South Taunton yesterday evening, and um, the, the view is that the, the particular property that is for sale has very bad neighbours, and two people, families have tried to live there and moved out within six months. So. They don't really, really feel that it's a question of bringing the house up to, up to standard, but it's a question of dealing with difficult tenants. So I don't know whether that, that would be part of the conversation in the future. Thanks. I, I can ask that question. Um, that shouldn't be a reason for disposal. We would expect them to, to, to robustly manage the, that property so that it, was not, it, it, did, it was, didn't continue to be a problem for all those neighbours know in forever so yeah I will I will ask that question perhaps you could send me that address and I will I'll look into it. Moise please. Sorry about this. Um, <clears throat> under the delivery on our plans for 11 self-contained departments in Tavistock I see at the bottom it says that officers are likely to have the results and the construction cost in March have we? No, we've been advised that that's been slightly delayed, so we're expecting that now in the beginning of April, unfortunately. But it's, it's, it's nearing, it's nearing there. Thank you. Councillor Kemp, please. Thank you, Chair. Recently on the BBC, there was mention of small prefab um, uh, accommodation being provided in, and I think this was in Bristol, for... Um, single people sleeping rough. Is that the kind of thing that is being considered at all? Our rough sleeper count, uh, estimate count in, uh, that was conducted in, in October came back with a count of zero. Um, and we do know that there are instances of rough sleeping, um, but the council operates a no second night out policy, so we do get people in very quickly. That accommodation, which is brilliant in Bristol um, and it's been largely adopted in, in Cornwall on council-owned sites, it, is, is really useful. However, we haven't got the, the need for it, that kind of accommodation for rough sleepers. Modular accommodation is something that we're considering, though, for, 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 as, as were our RPs uh, for, for, for construction in the future. 
Yes, exactly. I think I was more thinking about your second comment than your first, because by the time that these prefab buildings had been updated by their tenants, they were very pleasant, airy places that could be at least fill a short-term need for small families. I mean, I wasn't really thinking of the of the rough sleeping market. Yes, the, 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 they've certainly come a long way, the modular construction. It, it's, it's really one to watch. I, I know a number of the housing associations that we work with are adopting those models, so it's, it's very likely that we'll see some accommodation of that type in, in West Devon in the future. Thank you. Any more questions? No. So the overview and scrutiny committee note progress in delivering against the plan for West Devon, improving homes, thematic delivery plan. Everybody happy to note the report? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Blake. Mr. White, sorry you've had such a long wait. Okay, Mr. White, if you would like to lead us through the uh, draft induction programme report. Thank you very much, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, the attached programme with the agenda papers is very much the culmination of the equivalent induction programme in May 2019. We had a survey, um, feedback survey, in the autumn of that year to gain initial thoughts and feedback and some of the views, or most of the views actually, that were forthcoming have been fed into the draft programme for 2023. We, of course, have also had um, task and finish group meetings with regard to the draft as well, so that has helped to formulate the content of the programme as drafted. And the only thing I'd, other thing I'd really say is that the key focus of the plan, as per the papers, is it's very much looking from the election day of the 4th of May up until the annual council on the 30th of May. There'll obviously be ongoing learning development thereafter. We've now got the calendar of meetings, for example, approved. So that will be, pop that will be populated in there with the draft agenda briefings, etc., going in as well. So the draft, as per the agenda papers, is very much from the 4th of May up to the 30th of May Annual Council. Thank you. Councillor Kimber. Thank you. I see... Um we've got in there also to be programmed as a tour of the borough which was not very popular last time which i was very disappointed about so it'd be nice if we can go ahead this time that's quite correct Councillor but it was it was in the original program and at the very last minute what three and three quarter years ago it had to be cancelled because we had a, a series of dropouts but funny enough when the draft program went to the senior leadership team that was one of the things that was taken away to say actually that was a that view was very much replicated by senior officers to say actually how useful and good at all would be and hopefully we'll get member support for that one going forward. I think with that one in particular, um, having done a few uh, tours like Councillor Moyes, um, is that you learn about other people's wards from their perspective because the tour always used to ask the ward member to come forward to point things out, say things about their ward and actually it's one of those things where particularly for new members, and you've got used to it now, but we shouldn't always be too parochial. We're here to represent the whole of West Devon, not just our patch. And, you know, some members need to look forward to the whole of West Devon. You know, we can have our favourite bit, but actually, when we're in this chamber, it's about the whole of West Devon. As a ward member, yes, it is about your patch, and be as parochial and passionate as you need to be, but in this arena, it is about the whole council. Um, Councillor Moyes. Yes, I totally agree um, with that sentiment about the tour. I think um, where, for instance, the planning committee is concerned, if you've got some idea of where um, this application is, it, it must help. Um, my actual point was, I was a little surprised that the member code of conduct was not until week four, because I... I do think that is fairly important for councillors to learn fairly close to the beginning. <laughs> it's, it 
it's a fine balance, isn't it? Because I've, we've tried to keep to the Tuesday member days wherever possible, and, and the, the point about putting it on the 23rd on week four was really to try and get it in before the first annual council meeting the following Tuesday. So it was a bit of a judgment call because the 16th of May was obviously what I call a planning day. So therefore, because we're conscious that particularly new members will be getting inquiries from constituents, subjectors, supporters about plan applications. So it was a balance of what goes first. So Tuesday night for May, sign in. Tuesday 16th of May, we felt planning. And then Tuesday 23rd of May was the code of conduct. So it's, it's, a, it's a judgment call, but it's things and roundabouts, really. Can I just say, I think it's the code of conduct presentation last time that took an hour that paint drying would have been more interesting um, so I think you know to get members engaged I think we do need to liven it up a bit and I don't know about a change of presenter um, right I'll leave that there um, the other thing I noticed that wasn't on it is uh, no fire escapes no fire exits and uh, that was brought up in the thing that we need maybe after the lunch, the first item after lunch, when all members will hopefully be here, that uh, we could just run through fire escapes, fire exits, what have you, uh, what to do if you hear where to go. Because um, <clears throat> that bit has come up before. Does anyone else have any questions about this? Because you've got to remember your experience from four years ago to what you would like to see happen this time that you felt was not as good as it may have been. Um, and the one big thing I think we would all agree on, most of us here, is that the people doing the presentations need to feel confident in what they're doing um, because sometimes they're very, very nervous. Um, and that doesn't really help the cause. So, yeah, it's Councillor Turnbull. Uh, yeah, obviously I responded to some um, queries in relation to this because the uh, myself, um, we both got elected on a by-election and kind of we missed out the induction. So I've kind of um, went through the last sort of nine, ten months. Um, so if there is another working group with this next time round, because I think we'll both have the induction again from, from scratch, I think I'd appreciate it if we're still here in May. Um, and then if there is a working group, then I'd love to sit on it to um, then give my opinion. Thank you for that. The two things I'd, I'd say to that would be, in addition to that, is that um, in September we'll look at refreshers as well to try, because we're always aware that it's such a, a tight time scale and so much to fit in. We'll do some refreshers in September, but again, we'll replicate the member survey in the autumn to see how it's gone this time around, what went well, what didn't go so well. So it'll be part of the on-the-on programme as well. Does anyone else have any questions on this item? No? Thank you very much, Mr White. Thank you, members. And uh, hopefully members have got an idea of the commitment that they're going to need to give in those first few weeks. Um, so finally, uh, item 10, the member learning and development opportunities. Um, so I do feel that actually that's not for me to say. Um, because it will be going forward to a next council and, you know, depending on who's elected, who's chairing, that uh, it should be their overview and scrutiny. Um, I'd like to thank you all for the commitment that you have shown over the last four years. I feel we've made great strides in some areas as an overview and community... Uh, oh, my God. Overview and scrutiny committee. Sorry. Um, so thank you all very much for that. And uh, some of the questions from some members have always struck a chord and sometimes made officers feel uncomfortable, which is no bad thing. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much to Cathy and to Amelia and to Daryl and to Steve for always being here to sort us all out. And to Mr Molyneux and uh, his sidekick, um, Mr Brook, who's attended. Uh, thank you both for all of your information that you've given to me personally and to be able to share at the meeting. And, of course, to my lovely Deputy Chair, Councillor Kimber. <laughs> Thank you very much. Who's been an absolute angel, who's become a good friend, and um, I wish you all well for those of you standing in the election. 
We will not have a meeting in April. We've crammed everything in. Uh, so we've got in everything that we were required to do. So we won't be having a meeting in April. So for those of you out on the campaign trail, we've got an extra few hours if there's meetings in the morning. I don't think there is. Um, so good luck to everybody. Thank you all.